Hi, everyone. Welcome to Foresight's Intelligent Operation Group. Uh, really, really happy to see so many of you here. Before we're going to launch into what has just been described as a bomb of a presentation, I will do some a minute of boring housekeeping, which shouldn't be all that boring, I hope at least. We have a workshop coming up, and many of you are already joining that workshop. But for those of you who may not know, of it yet. It's our in-person workshop where this group and other people can also apply to, as you've seen this on YouTube, meet once a year annually to discuss the intersection between cryptography, security, and AI with the kind of premise that there's a lot that the kind of cryptographic and security communities can contribute for making AI secure. And I'm assuming that Pooja will also discuss a few of these aspects later, but if you're interested in really spending two days to kind of like figure out like a solution space here, and then please do join us in San Francisco. It's at the Internet Archive and it's coming up relatively soon. I'm going to share the link here in the chat. We still have a few spots and applications open, even though we're filling up relatively fast. So that's all on my end for boring housekeeping. I'm really, really excited to have Pooja here with us today. I've met you, I think, a few times now, including at our Vision Weekend in France. And I think we just missed each other at Suzalu, but you've been like a fantastic, I think, just coordinator and researcher in the space and mostly of decentralized technologies, but have done a lot of other work too and have really put your minds of thinking about like how can we use these technologies um, to kind of like help make AI go favorably for humanity recently. And yeah, I'm really happy that we got this very short notice talk together. Really excited for your presentation. And I'll be in the chat monitoring for questions. And I should say that I will be presenting on a similar topic, mostly focusing on the cryptographic tool set um, tomorrow uh, at the same time. So I think it could be a nice back-to-back -back and really excited for the discussion. And for now, the stage is yours. Please take it away uh, and I'll share more info about you in the chat. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you so much, Allison, for that kind introduction. And I just want to say I'm humbled to be in the front of this audience. There's a lot of people here already who I owe a lot of intellectual debts to. Steve Mohundro in particular has been an old friend and I think for more spanning even 10 years ago in my backyard in Palo Alto, discussing a lot of these questions. And so again, very humbled to have this audience and I look forward to everybody's comments. And just a warning, this is quite a, this is a audio and visual and maybe more visual talk. And it's designed to pump your intuitions. It's exploratory. It's, it's probably an unusual presentation. And so I thank you in advance for kind of bringing all of your senses. And, and with that, I will get started. Let me share my screen. Is my screen visible to you? Looks great. Okay, great. <clears throat> so I will get started. Allison, it is remarkable that I'm here and that I can utter these strings of sounds and they're intelligible to you and that you understand what I mean. Moreover, if I said to the audience here, I love you all, you would assume one of two things about me. Either I'm delusional or I'm lying. You not only understand what these sounds mean, you can infer some things about me when I say them. But strings of sound don't just mysteriously convey meaning. Depending on the audience's background beliefs, words have power. Strings of sound can stir men towards progress, start wars, turn the tide of wars, usher in peace, motivate an entire generation. So language is human's greatest invention. And like food, language can either nourish us or poison us. And so the question today is, how do we govern and align exponentially powerful technologies built off our conversations when in the conversations themselves, we are often debating, politicking, and fumbling our way towards truth. When we talk alignment, one string of sounds that resonates with the audience here is the word decentralization. But what does that mean? Many refer to other words to explain it, but perhaps the best way to understand decentralization is to look at the most decentralized invention we have to date, language. And instead of modeling an idealized version of how language ought to work, Let's start with our intuitive and uncorrected view of language. Let's start with the basics and a word that has nourished us all, love. We're born into this world, given a name, and this is our first contact with language and with love. We grow into a broader set of affections and solidarities, branching beyond our families to our schools and neighborhoods. And each of these communities are strange at first and then become familiar. And we have changing magnitudes of affection and trust towards them. Moreover, each of these communities have different conversational norms and boundaries. What you say, how you say it is different in each of these contexts. I love you, dad. I love you, school crush. I love you, sweet heavenly baby Jesus. 
Love means different things in all these contexts. And yet there are other words that have unambiguous meanings, table, chair, school. Learning language is learning correlations of words in social context. These correlations of words in context also become correlations of beliefs and desires. A mysterious interaction between our hearts and our minds correlates what we hear with what we believe and what we want. Highly religious parents, for example, impart their beliefs to their children. In mimesis, kids will want a toy just because other kids want a toy, not knowing what it does. It's through conversation, starting at the dinner table, moving to the classroom and beyond, that we form and evolve our beliefs and desires and preferences, and more importantly, the words to express them. As a kid, my siblings generally share the same memberships, the same social geometry with little distance. We are correlated in our beliefs and desires, and we're correlated in how we use the words to express them. But as we enter adolescence, we broaden our communities and self-differentiate. We form secret societies. We fall in love. We fall out of love and retreat to our families. And at some point, many choose to enter a gated conversation where we agree to learn and get tested and measure how well we converse by a discipline's rules. Some, like math, have right and wrong answers. And some, like law, have a rich set of procedural practices that are continually under conversational scrutiny, but nonetheless lay the ground rules for debating the bounds of what is legal versus illegal, contested versus uncontested, admissible versus inadmissible. And at some point, we join this larger political conversation where we have rights of participation and a say in how a larger nested coordination is governed. And so as we age, we grow a rich network of overlapping solidarities and memberships to different communities with different magnitudes of affection. These communities are perpetually in fluid stochastic recombination, contracting and expanding. But is this what we mean by decentralized language, recombining stochastic conversations? No. Sometimes when conversations get snuffed out, groups get annihilated, languages entirely disappear. Language does not have a peaceful, decentralized equilibrium. Instead, communities have metastable governance structures, which influence how the conversation unfolds, what is said, in what order, who says it, when, and how. One governance structure touted by the more egalitarian-minded is one person, one vote, where everyone gets an equal say. Ancient Athens experimented with this, and it left the most skilled conversationalist of the time, Socrates, murdered by a tyranny of the majority. This coincided, of course, with the loss of the Peloponnesian War and the end of the Golden Age of Athens. Maybe this wasn't a coincidence. Now, there's a second touted model, raw capitalism, or one dollar, one vote, or one token, one vote, like Bitcoin. The more dollars you have, the more hash power you can buy, the more Bitcoin you can buy. But let's look at this from the perspective of the community constituting Bitcoin in dark mode. Aspirationally, the Bitcoin community is a sea of anons, subscribing to the rules of Bitcoin capitalism. But one token, one vote money, one token, one vote capitalism, in that system, money buys power, literally hash power, and not everyone has the same resources to start with. And even if they do, no one shares the same savings or consumptions rate. So what do we end up with? Plutocracy, a panel of miners and pool operators constituting 90% of Bitcoin's hash power, all sitting on a panel together. But like direct democracy, plutocracy has a social effect here too, on our conversations. If one token, one vote is about buying influence, then the rich have more power and social circles start to coalesce around them. Culturally, the less wealthy who aspire to have that power begin to engage in speculation, hyper-financialization, and looting networks through 51% attacks. When one token, one vote models are applied to businesses with increasing returns, the power of plutocrats can increase exponentially. Apple farms subject to decreasing returns is not the same as data farms subject to increasing returns. And the power of increasing returns can lead plutocrats to have outsized or correlated influence over political parties, national security, social media, and technology, including AI. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So how do these two models stack up against each other? With one person, one vote, votes are too cheap for those who care little and too expensive for those who care a lot. With one token, one vote, or one dollar, one vote, the opposite is true. Votes are too expensive for those who care little and too cheap for those who care a lot. But there's a third model, authoritarianism. One person deciding what's communicated, how, and to whom. Now, the more information an authoritarian has, the greater control they exert, which allows them to control information even more 
in a self-reinforcing cycle towards greater and greater power. Inconvenient dissidents that challenge this power tend to disappear. And eventually, people end up talking about what the dictator wants them to talk about, and the social distance between conversational clusters narrows. Citizens become symbols for the dictator equivalent to mindless bots, and we get language inversion, where meaning does not map onto reality and where we collapse into contradiction. It's no coincidence that the greatest abuses of power are marked by the greatest abuses of language. So when it comes to governance over communication, we have these three general models, one person, one vote, one dollar, one vote, and authoritarianism. And each of these end up empowering some set of groups over others, tyrannical majorities, leading plutocrats, or controlling dictators. And of course, this has social consequences, at worst, turning us into murderous majorities, hyper-financializing us, or making us civil robots. And all of them universally narrow and homogenize the social groups to which we belong, as well as a breadth and depth of conversation. But we generally don't see these extremes. We see correctives instead, or checks and balances pushing us towards something in the center, drawing on the virtue of these approaches while compensating for their weaknesses. For example, direct democracy has given way to the idea of constitutional republics marked by separation of powers, constitutionalism, common law, federalism, and so on. This system forces conversations among competing groups representing different interests, domestic circles, foreign circles, and even long dead founding fathers requiring some bit of translation. Similarly, modern corporate governance is actually a rejection of peer token voting. And instead, we have a compromise with the CEO, board, and shareholders with forced information disclosure by way of law to enrich these conversations. Even authoritarian regimes like to keep the optics of democracy with elections, even if rigged, and capitalism, even if crony. So in the 20th century, this simplistic model has actually given way to something like this, autocracy, constitutional republics, and corporations. And with exponentially powerful information technologies, the 21st century is seeing another variation on the same theme with digital democracy, synthetic technocracy, and corporate libertarianism. And today we see instances of all these governance structures and all the diverse conversational communities to which we belong to. Going back to kids, even they experience a variety of governance structures, which influence what, how, and when they talk. If born Catholic, they learn the Vatican's rules on what's conversationally unacceptable or what we call heresy. If they go to a public parochial or private school, they get exposed to mixed governance structures, being accountable towards the state, church, and dollars, respectively, in different degrees. And perhaps we see the greatest variance at the family's dinner table, except, of course, when kids outnumber the parents, and then we have pure anarchy. These governance structures influence how conversations cluster and recombine, and more deeply, how words come to correlate with meaning, belief, and desires. Authoritarian regimes are an extreme example, with greater clustering, less recombination, and a collapse of meaning into contradiction. Now, the question is, How do generative foundation models change conversational dynamics? Will they collapse us into the singularity like authoritarianism or majoritarianism like one person, one vote or plutocratic pump and dumps with one token, one vote? Or will we have something like rich intersectionality with a lot of social recombination? Let's consider our latest touch point with digital communication, social media. In exchange for using these communitarian paradises for free, We let them hoover up our conversations in a giant information commons where we graze on addictive algorithms, often feeding on anger, paranoia, and vanity. So far, so good. But let's break down actually what's really happening here. We enter these channels ready to communicate, but our words travel instantaneously beyond the intended audience and context in which they were made, causing socially distant audiences to misjudge, become outraged, and engage. Even if our words aren't intended to become maximally controversial scissor statements, they become so. And this has several consequences. First, communication traveling beyond context has cleaved groups, and artificially so. Algorithms aside, outrage groups pull in the socially proximate conversational clusters into empathetic outrage. Second, because people are broadcasting to a giant conversational commons primed to graze on it in the most controversial way, speech is chilled. And instead, we encourage a different kind of speech or a different kind of conversation, anonymous trolling. This unaccountable mob behavior leaves our digital spaces and invades our physical spaces, even in law schools like my alma mater, 
where the conversational norm is to make your case through coherent arguments, not masks, not memes. Now, what about the unseen? By throwing people into a conversational commons and then outraging and cleaving them, we actually erase local conversational groups, local speech norms, and local contexts. But these boundaries are important. Words do not have an inherent meaning, but are relational and contextual, embedded in a constellation of facts, circumstances, relationships, and most importantly, shared beliefs of the audience. When I say I love you, clearly that's not the same love when I tell my son I love you. And yet by erasing these boundaries, instead of contextual communication, we get context collision, reducing our plurality into polarity, where people are confused and our ability to communicate is fundamentally impaired. Rather than wrestle with hard and controversial ideas openly, we talk less, debate less, refine less. Instead, we find ourselves unwittingly in cleaved conversational clusters and correlated meme and cancel culture verses. These social media correlations become financial correlations. Finance becomes vulnerable to speculation and hyperfinancialization. Digital bank runs tweet themselves into existence. Words become lowest common denominator memes, correlating beliefs and desires into actions. To the point where Wall Street, Silicon Valley, Washington, and crypto conversational clusters start stress testing public confidence games like credit markets to their correlation limits. And the limits are not as difficult to break as you might think, just a threshold 10 to 20% of the population believing otherwise, and suddenly bullets are worth more than Bitcoin. And of course, we get the worst of all antisocial behaviors, mindless bots, anonymous mobs, hyperfinancialization. Now, what governance model has led to this? It's not completely $1, one vote capitalism because users get to use the platforms for free and data creators have no residual rights. But it's also not one person, one vote democracy because there are clearly a class of shareholders profiting off these cleavages and collision courses. It's actually a tragedy of the conversational commons, combining the worst aspects of captured communism, one conversational commons like nationalized oil fields, and the worst aspects of capitalism where a few control a rent extracting brain fracking monopoly. It's something oscillating between synthetic technocracy where an elite optimizes with a God's eye view and corporate libertarianism that sends rents to a class of shareholders increasingly correlated with the technocrats. Now, good generative foundation models make our conversations worse. How? GFMs are trained on various data sets, including we can fairly assume conversations in the information commons scraped from the internet. They generate text by identifying correlations and finding complex nonlinear relationships between words and phrases within the training data. The problem is not simply that the data sets from our information commons have traveled outside their context, the facts, background beliefs, and relationships that the words embed within. The problem is GFMs can recombine data sets into plausible deep fakes that flood the information commons, which then feed back into the training models in a vicious cycle accelerating context collision into full context collapse. When our background beliefs about consensus reality fracture, we also lose our ability to form strings of sounds that are intelligible, conveying meaning. For communication to happen, a shared background of beliefs is required, that I'm here, that the sun is shining, that I am talking, and an assumption that most of what I'm telling you I actually believe to be true. Disagreement and agreement alike are intelligible only against a background of massive agreement. Meaning and belief are inextricably linked. But is there another future where GFMs augment communicative capacity and make us more intelligible to each other while grounding us in truth and a shared consensus reality? Where instead of collapsing us into singularity, we expand into plurality? I think so. How do we get there? First, many model social graphs on individuals, but individuals are networks of groups, just as groups are networks of individuals. They are mutually defined duality like waves and particles. So model emergent groups, not just sovereign individuals. Step two, reintroduce the boundaries we have in physical space into digital space, make the physically implicit digitally explicit. Not all communication should be broadcast into space. And as an extension of two, represent membership to groups with socially programmable objects represented here as triangles that confer rights of participation 
And importantly, make explicit the channel's governance mechanism. Is governance one person, one vote, one dollar, one vote, quadratic vote? Is it an attention algo or an auction? Express the mechanism in a governance triangle. Now, the constellation of these triangles represent our access and governance over the digital communication channels we participate in. You can call them soul bound because they represent your access and no one else's, or you can call them community bound as communities grant these memberships or access rights. Again, like wave particle duality, individuals and communities are two different angles to the same phenomena. Let's take the community view. When a community has one person, one vote, each member holds this programmable triangle, representing their access right or credential to the community conversation and their right to vote on how this channel is governed and how their shared conversational data is used. For example, what information the community chooses to reveal, to whom, in exchange for what, money or information from another group? In other words, the triangle confers the right to vote on the group's privacy. Now, some channels might not have governance rights. If everyone is part of the Putin channel, it becomes clear that holding a black triangle, Putin controls the channel. Here, the triangle is simply making the implicit explicit. Now, once we represent governance, the next step is to improve it and better price influence. Rather than the perils of one person, one vote, and one token on vote, where influence is either too cheap or too expensive, we can make the marginal cost of influence proportional to how much you actually value a good through quadratic voting, quadratic funding, or some variation of square root voting. Quadratic in voting and funding are partial correctives to the majoritarian tyrannies of one person, one vote, and the plutocracy of one dollar, one vote, pushing us towards the center. But quadratic voting and funding are not enough because it's just correcting for one kind of correlation when there are many other hidden correlations because of our conversational ties. To draw an analogy to stars, on the surface, we look like these self-sovereign stars emanating idiosyncratic beliefs and desires through space-time. And so we square root over the intensity of our preferences so we can differentiate and also see the light from other stars as light obeys an inverse square law. But light is also a wave and has properties instantaneously entangled with other light waves across vast distances. So what we wanna know is underneath the intensity of our preferences, how correlated our spin or biases with other people's light waves by this invisible, messy, stochastic social process we call communication, especially when digital communication accelerates these entanglements across different distance. So rather than treat people as the same uncorrelated, non-conversational, sovereign individual without social ties, we take an extra step. We cluster by overlap and similarity and then discount influence based off of shared conversational memberships or shared triangles as well as revealed behavior. In other words, we don't treat a hundred dupe puppets or mindless bots having the same narrow clustered conversations under the thumb of an authoritarian, the same as a highly intersectional person debating across very different groups. We acknowledge the spin or bias of correlated conversational groups and discount against them so they don't secretly collude to swamp voting. For example, if this is a simplified representation of my conversational clusters, and this is a representation of my siblings, you would find these conversational overlaps. No two people have the same conversations, but everyone has varying degrees of overlap and social distance to everyone else. We acknowledge this overlap and discount for the correlation. Financial markets offer a helpful analogy. Just as a portfolio manager rings out the idiosyncratic risk of poor managerial judgment and dysfunctional corporate culture by diversifying across less correlated assets, similarly, communities can ring out the idiosyncratic risk by discounting across correlated conversational clusters prone to share bias and make the same errors in judgment. Now, this doesn't eliminate systematic risk, but it does ring out the idiosyncratic risk, which left unchecked unnecessarily adds risk to the system and obfuscates the real systematic risk for us to focus on. So back to our governance triangle. If quadratic voting and funding are partial correctives, adding correlation discounting towards governance into a prism 
allowing communities to bend and refract what is otherwise a monolithic light into differentiated colors. So we can see the unique colors of less bias, less correlated perspectives, sharply and in their full brilliance. This prism governance is consensus across difference, where we weigh the intensity of preferences of the more conversationally distant, less correlated, and less overlapping to surface proposals more likely to be in the community's interest rather than in any cluster's narrow private interest, which might give them more information or control over everyone else. So consensus across difference also implies community collusion resistance. Collusion resistance is particularly important when a community is negotiating to share data with another community, which may have overlapping members and a conflict of interest, or when it decides to say auction off or federate some of their data to a third party, which may have overlapping shareholders. Now, when communities rely on consensus across difference as a governance mechanism and scale up their cooperative agreements with other communities, they form collusion resistant networks where more conversationally distant communities have a greater influence than the clustered and conversationally near. Checking the concentration of information and control, or what we call power, of a cluster of groups and instead rebalancing it perpetually as these groups stochastically recombine. So instead of private goods, networks are able to generate shared network goods resistant to political capture and economic extraction. Now, what does this mean for the individual? Just as collusion resistance leans on the diversity amongst a very conversationally distanced to surface what's in the network's broader interest, community recovery leans on the diversity to secure your private interest or account where a qualified majority of your uncorrelated conversational partners can recover your account. In other words, collusion resistance for a network implies community recovery for the individual. So now we start to get a more robust sense of what we mean by decentralization, not by reference to these other concepts begging for definitions and clarity, or by treating all people the same with one person, one vote, or treating all money equally with one token, one vote. Rather, decentralization requires surfacing hidden correlations when events are not as statistically independent as presumed to be, leading to accidental failures, or when people are not as conversationally distant as presumed to be, leading to intentional attacks. Fault tolerance and attack resistance are not inherent properties of a system, but relational properties. And failures are the result of hidden correlations leading to hidden governance games or hidden triangles. The prism of collusion-resistant governance protects against these failures, starting with communities and scaling into networks. So we arrive at a conception of decentralization that is coherent across all levels of social scales, individuals, communities, and networks. Collusion resistance, consensus across difference, and community community recovery are mutually implicated properties of decentralized systems. Now that we have a conception of how decentralization works, how are these concepts relevant for generative foundation models and augmenting our communicative capacity? Recall, GFMs are trained off various data sets. We can reasonably assume, again, these data sets are, include conversations from the information commons. There are increasing returns from economies of scale and economies of scope to these models. The more inputs and the greater diversity of inputs they receive, the more powerful they are at representing a mysterious syntax, the rules of grammar underlying human communication. It's not feasible for communities to train their own frontier generative foundation models that have as rich a syntax as these large models have. Important to recognize that. Moreover, the underlying architectures and structures actually have more similarities than differences. So what can we do? Ideally, conversational communities would fine tune and adapt generative foundation models to their local context, using the prism of consensus across difference to surface diverse agreement on important questions like what constitutes training data for the local adaptation, what privacy preserving techniques should be used, 
how adjustments to the weights and biases of these adaptive models should be made in both supervised learning and reinforcement learning. In this way, communities could have sovereignty in how the model behaves when it comes to things that are relevant to them. And someone from China, for example, wouldn't have as much of an authority to say how the model should behave when it comes to questions about Audrey Tong as someone in Taiwan. Building on subsidiarity, many communities running their local adaptations on these GFMs could feed back elements or properties to the larger GFMs in a federated way. Or better yet, these partially localized and adapted models could help communities negotiate with each other to share data about each other. And this would build larger nested adaptations. So we would have localized adaptations interoperating, overlapping, and recombining into larger adaptations with partially shared data sets. By using consensus across difference at the local level and scaling up to collusion resistance at the network level, this larger networked AI could capture and refract out the background shared beliefs of local context composing into network context. And more importantly, feed back these properties into the GFMs in a federated way to improve the weights and biases of the GFMs. So localized adaptations would continuously improve on the GFMs while the GFMs in return would fine tune from the local network model. In sum, we get partial adaptations interoperating with other partial adaptations that together form a networked model that improves, fine tunes, and ultimately aligns a GFM in a federated way. To draw an analogy here, imagine there's a fleet of giant ships that are more similar than different. And as they stop in each port, they add on a sail getting bigger and more powerful. Now these giant ships all have a magnitude and a direction. And at the same time, there's a sea of smaller boats with much more differentiation, rowboats, fishing boats, speed boats, shrimp boats, et cetera. And they all have their own magnitudes and directions as well. Now imagine all of these smaller boats latch a rope onto the larger ships, gaining the speed and momentum of the larger ships, but at the same time shifting the magnitude and direction of the ships. We don't know in advance how all these forces will cancel each other out. Instead, the main question for us is how many ropes does a boat get or how strong do we want these ropes to be? In other words, how much influence should these smaller boats have? Do they get all treated the same? Is it based off of how much gold they have? Or do we do something else? Do we look at where these boats came from, how similar they are, and how many of them have walkie-talkies coordinating their pull? We aim for consensus across difference at the boat level and collusion resistance at the ship level. So like decentralization, we get a rich conception of AI alignment here that is now coherent and consistent across all levels of social scales, individuals, communities, and networks. Discounting the biases of the conversationally near and correlated, where the most distant communities check, constrain, and fine tune the weights and biases of a networked AI, and where ceaselessly recombining communities leads to richer and richer expressions of overlapping complex and even canceling out preferences. And in the process, we get rich information provenance, where we can tell if an artificial generation arose from a socially distant group without much conversational overlap, or if the generations emerge from a credible conversational cluster with shared secrets, perhaps re represented through designated verifier groups. And this, of course, enables and empowers us to curate our intention to engage in those conversations about credible information, facilitating greater network co cooperation. Now, the question is, why can't we get our collusion-resistant AI today? That would require OpenAI to share its model. And taking the principle of charity here, it doesn't want to do this or wouldn't want to do this because we don't have our boats lined up, so to speak and malicious, well-coordinated pirate ships could come to over-influence a GFM. We want everyone to have access to nuclear energy, but not everyone should have nuclear weapons. Which takes us back here to the task of reintroducing digital boundaries and representing governance with objects, triangles that refract out consensus across difference and reintroduces context. But instead, we're here erasing boundaries contemplating instead eyeball scans and one person, one vote schemes. That's why we need to start building new communication channels that enable communities to localize credible governance and build a collusion resistant governance infrastructure that we need. And to get us started, a plural cooperative known as the PCC 
which I'm a part of, has introduced and gifted a plural communication channel as a starting point for experimentation. It's essentially a discourse fork where the agenda is surfaced by collusion-resistant quadratic voting. And this discourse fork allows you to express the intensity of your preference with hearts, but at the same time, it recognizes and discounts the social cluster you are part of based on correlation factors set by the community, which could be workplace, geography, political affiliation, and so on. This way, minority vo voices don't get drowned out and communities can surface questions which multiple perspectives agree on is interesting. Now, it's just a playful first step, but we nonetheless hope that communities will run their own instance of this and start experimenting and pushing us in the right direction. And with tools like the Plural Communication Channel, the goal is to augment our communicative capacity and cooperation across groups, harnessing collective intelligence. So with credible information, agents can ceaselessly and fluidly recombine into new groups with a multiplicity of aims into a thickening web of interweaving solidarities that cuts open asymmetries and information and control, or what we call power. Many people communicating in a networked way, governing partially and plurally, continuously recomposing into fluid social groups, so one or a small cluster doesn't come to dominate them all. And so ironically, to keep AI aligned, we just have to keep talking and talking about the things that matter to us, like love, but to the people we actually love with boundaries around these conversations. And then AI can help us keep talking, not to just our near and dear, but also to the conversationally distant, the foreign and the strange, generating conversational bridges to communities at any social scale, near and far, and ultimately keeping language a source of nourishment. Thank you. Wonderful. That was quite the bomb. Thanks for dropping it. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah, that was a lot. Thank you so much. I think we already have a bunch of questions lined up that were started in the chat. And it's just a reminder, um, I don't know if you want a little break or if you're happy to just roll with it. I'm happy to roll with it. And I also see my collaborator here, Glenn, has joined. So maybe I'll let him take some of these questions while, while I grab a sip of water. Sounds good. I'm going to take people so that they can ask them um, themselves. If, if you don't okay. mind, I think it's usually it provides it more context. But I don't know, for example, Alex Gurley, if you want to ask your question online or if you want me to ask it. Sure. Thanks a lot for the talk, Pooja. So the question is, I understand how collusion resistance could work at a community level, at a, at a small group. They could make sure that people in the same family aren't colluding their votes or something like that because they have information about them and they can compute that. But it, how at a global scale can you do collusion resistance among all the groups? What's to stop a civil attack of so spinning up a lot of groups that are highly correlated in their vote? And how do you do that in a computationally tractable way? Pooja, do you want me to take it or do you want to take it? I'll let you answer and then I'll jump in. Great question. So let's start conceptually with like how it could work instead of compatibility, et cetera. And then we can talk a little bit more about how to get there. So <clears throat> I think that the key thing, Alex, is that people actually have an incentive to reveal their social affiliations because it can give them the ability to participate in governing that group. So on the one hand, of course, they're going to reduce their influence on some more global decision, but their influence on the global decision is always going to be relatively small. That's the idea of the free rider problem, right? Is that Global decisions are actually things that people don't really want to invest very much in control of. And by revealing their social affiliations, they gain status or the ability to influence on more local decisions. This is an approximation to the usual trade off between public and private goods. And we know that, like, people are willing to sacrifice a lot of public goods for a little bit of private good because the private good is like more specific to them because they only have a small influence on the global public good. At least in principle, I believe that if you link the ability to have influence on the local community to the revelation of that affiliation, that there's, there's an incentive compatibility condition there that's very analogous to the things that show up in more standard, you know, individualistic game theory. You know, in terms of like how to get there and, for example, how to avoid 
some like bespoke group forming that then comes in and just attacks the system. I think that you have to build it on the basis of some kind of web of trust like architecture, where if someone is entering a system and there's a bunch of alleged people, all of whose trust links to whoever's administering the process pass through that one person or that small set of people, like the aggregate amount of resources that you should allow them to, you know, appropriate through that system are, it should be small, right? So there should be some kind of a trust building process that happens not just at an individual level, but at the level of sort of any social community that might be gated through the trust vested in an individual. Anyway, I'll leave it there. There's a lot more to discuss. This is obviously an open research area, not like a settled thing, but at least this is the reason why I have some optimism that there's a good answer to these questions. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I, I do have a forthcoming paper, which you like, Alex, that actually looks at civil resistance as a mirror problem of collusion resistance. And But I, I think there's a couple of things. Yes, building on actual trust and high bandwidth communication channels. And of course, the most high bandwidth communication channel is like talking with people in person. And so, so, so reiterated interactions like that, we can kind of like recalibrate and the network to kind of filter out the civils, right? Through surfacing these high bandwidth communication channels and emphasizing points of trust where they exist. But um, let me just like, disagree a tiny bit with just one statement you made, which is that talking in person is the highest bandwidth communication channel. I actually think there's even higher bandwidth communication channels. I think there's a reason why like the intimate relationship is such a foundation of trust in, in the pretty much every human society, which is that there's a lot of things that are not captured by communication and they can be captured by other sensory experiences, right? And so like, I actually think we don't, you know, there's a whole range of communication forms that like in-person conversation is actually somewhere on that spectrum. It's a pretty high bandwidth one, but there's actually even higher bandwidth ones. Yeah. And I will also add one kind of insight is there, <clears throat> when you're designing these systems, the cost of civil should probably increase exponentially or super linearly relative to the kind of social uh, complexity or social recombination of groups. So like the more the intuition there is like the more the more many groups and intersectional puja is, the harder it is to actually like influence me, right? And the cost of influence like probably should go up in like a super linear way. And we can kind of translate those insights also to how we think about civils and increasing the cost of civils. But this is again a, a deep and open research area. Hmm. Should we go to the well, next question? Yeah, I just want to make one one more point because I I will also talk a little bit about civil as a kind of like interesting way to think about anti collusion for AI. I think one thing that you can do with, for example, to at least potentially avoid civil attacks or make them less poignant is doing something like proof of location in normal crypto networks, like basically actually proving that a computation on is spread out. And it seems difficult to do that for AI systems. So, you know, like oftentimes with crypto, you can actually incentivize people to kind of like be spread out physically, which also often means that they're in different jurisdictions, which, which kind of like insinuates that uh, it's harder to collude, <laughs> but that's harder to do with AI. So I wonder if there's like a kind of virtual way of doing proof of locations for AIs, but that's more like a, I guess, like a general question in case anyone has thoughts on this, but if not, we'll go uh, next with Jazia. Hi, Pooja. Thank you for, for sharing. I guess I'm I'm actually working on a blockchain or cryptocurrency meets AI, you know, large system, but it, it takes a very different approach, assuming that the training and customization of these models is way cheaper than you might be thinking. I, I know it, it's not that hard to to I think train a GFM given existing GFMs and a lot of them are being specialized in different ways. And I, I kind of imagine maybe one person having many such models highly customized over, you know, time and, and so on. And I guess I'm, I'm just wondering, can you maybe describe how you arrived at this model of communities or one community converging on a single model to be used and trained and making that really a, a highly prized you know, computation layer versus in, individual communities or even members of communities having multiple GFMs or multiple LLMs that are constantly changing over time? I'm just wondering, you know, does the economy actually, yeah, just how, how did you come up with that design paradigm and 
I'm, I'm fascinated because mine is quite, quite different. Yeah. So I, I don't claim to be an expert and I think this will, yeah, we'll see a lot of LLMs in different communities. I think what I'm, what I was thinking about was like the frontier GFM, right. That's like kind of at the bleeding edge and therefore probably has right more risk associated with it. How do you align that frontier model? And, but, you know, communities using many other LLMs for different uses and purposes, like I, yeah, that's totally legitimate view. And I think the game theory on this is quite complex and I, I wouldn't want to say it one way or the other, but Glenn, do you have any views on this? Yeah. Is there what I'd say is I, I, I'm not certain of the following, but I don't think there's any evidence yet to contradict it, which is that all of the frontier progress has been made at very large scales and with highly diverse data. And that the sort of distillation and Laura work all proceeds from progress at that level. And so I think that you can think of those distilled and localized models as some form of fine tuning. And that form of fine, and that fine tuning at present doesn't actually go back to advance the capabilities or alter the behavior of the underlying model that is being distilled, even though a local community, you know, can fine tune it and adapt it for their own purposes, but not, but can't necessarily have agency over how the broader model behaves if someone else doesn't use their particular, you know, local adaptation. So yes, absolutely. There's going to be all kinds of localizations. I don't think they're all going to be necessarily as local as you're describing, Jazir, because the, there's going to be reasons even beyond the diversity of sort of the overall model, while you, why you're going to want fine tunings that are broader than that. For example, um, think about breast cancer. Breast cancer is not really a medical problem. It's like a data cooperation problem. We know that like almost all breast cancers can be avoided if they can be reliably detected early. And we know that a sufficiently trained expert is able to detect breast cancer very early. So the real question is just how do we scale that capability? And that depends on having a lot of breast cancer images, which exist in the world, but can't be shared across medical privacy boundaries, right? And like, that's a very clear case where that's private data, that adaptation won't just go into a global GFM, but, but it's clearly something that's going to be shared by a lot of different medical institutions if it's going to be effective in eliminating breast cancer. Anyway. I think that these different things are actually, as far as I know, consistent with each other and can coexist and, and are largely consistent with the vision that Pooja was describing, at least in their most performant version. Awesome. Yeah, and I, I would just say you can also, so it's not, the, the vision is not there's one frontier model and then there's these like partial lo lo localized adaptations. There's also other models. It's just how do we, given the sort of power of this frontier model and all in which, as Glenn said, re relies on the diversity of inputs. Like, how do we align and fine tune that? Because that that is really kind of where the existential risk. And there's also a risk in these other, say, even using communities fine tuning their partialized lo local adaptations with other LLMs. You can imagine like also interactions. And Steve Amohundro, who's on this call, I'm very curious what his opinions on this are. He's talked a lot about personal AIs as well. So. Of course, there's going to be like an ecosystem and a network of interactions here. But my, my talk was mostly focused on the, the frontier model. Awesome. Wonderful. Next one up here in the chat, and I'm just going down as fast as I can because we have so many other questions bubbling up here. But next one up, we have David. Oh, I, I just, I had a thought about the, the fact that, you know, when you talk about people belonging to multiple communities and communicating in multiple communities and the, there's a huge amount of cost for individuals, especially if they're supposed to make that legible. So some significant fraction of the communities that I interact with aren't online and making that explicit would be very expensive. I think that it's very easy for us who are basically all, you know, I, I guess internet people to to think of everything as as happening in ways that's relatively easy for these systems to uh, make legible, but 
I think that there's actually a huge hidden cost there. Yeah, that's that's totally fair. And those offline communities, I would say, are the most high bandwidth channels that we have, right? And so the 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 goal is to actually kind of like preserve those conversations in those communities, right? And and but I think as we become entering a more digital age, what we want to do is try to kind of impart the norms from those communities that are offline and bring them online, right? To the extent that we can, and and that's a challenge. Uh, but yeah, the, the, that's a valid point. All right, maybe the last one will be Wes Chow. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious if, if you've thought about whether or not there's situations where a community may want to bias their governance towards, let's say, autocracy or one person, one vote temporarily, and that how the communities might be able to decide on that kind of a change over time. You mean, so a community decides we got to get started somewhere, we're going to do, you know, direct democracy, and then how do they transition? That? Right. You know, maybe there's some some sort of, a, you know, major event in the world in which they decide, oh, or at least, you know, it might be useful for the community to switch governance systems and then, you know, and then be able to switch back. Like, I, you know, I just imagine that over time, the governance needs must not be constant, right? Like it must fluctuate. So, so the question is, how do they switch governance mechanisms, right? I, I don't know. <laughs> this is like the stuff of politics. And I think communities have their own. Every, you know, all, all, there's, all politics are family politics, as much diversity as there are in families, there are in communities. So each one has to grapple with this in their own way. But I, I will say that, you know, com- there are shared data assets. So actually back to David's question here, communities have shared assets. You know, conversational data is one of them. And, and using, for example, LLMs to help communities like communicate and speak within each other and across to other communities, right? And so they will want to figure out some governance mechanism and how do we, you know, draw on the benefits of our data without to, to help us communicate and bridge conversations within and across communities without maybe giving too much up, right? Or exposing ourselves too much. And what privacy preserving mechanisms do we want to use? Yeah, I don't have a question answer to your question about how to make this seamless, but I, I think, you know, education on the sort of pitfalls of some of these mechanisms is really important, right? I mean, Wes, I don't think it's absolutely always the case, but I do think it's usually the case that there's a way to play even a broken game as a more stable and powerful mechanism and, you know, kind of win at it. You can, you can help a political party unify itself better using one of these things, even if it's playing like a problematic Duverger game you know, with another party. And then that experience can lead the whole system to change because it creates new forms of legitimacy. If you can harness a mechanism to make a capitalist company more powerful, then it can win the capitalism game. And eventually people might think that we should reformat the whole system in, along this line. So I, I tend to be like a cautious optimist that there are ways to like harness broken games, especially when there's a diversity of broken games to lead to better outcomes, even if the game itself is well matter. Wonderful. We are now exactly at time, but I don't want to let you go, Glenn and Puja, without asking the final question, which is usually if people get excited about your work on this topic, how can they find out more? What's any follow-ups that you want to share? I will be releasing a paper soon to the Getting Plurality Network. And I think, Glenn, you can speak about your own work. Yeah, check out plurality.net, contribute to the repo. And of course, and actually what's interesting, Radical Exchange will be launching a an instance of the plural communication channel. And maybe if there's a lot of questions, we can divert some of them there for an ongoing discussion. And they'll be using it to curate attention for their town halls. I would look to Radical Exchange for kind of like new new sort of frontier governance mechanisms and attention curation. Awesome. Thank you. I already shared the plurality.net link here in the chat. If you have any links that you guys want me to share with the group when we can release this episode, then let me know. Otherwise, thank you everyone for joining. Thanks for staying a minute longer. Have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll see some of you for a related presentation tomorrow. Thanks everyone. Bye.